Okay, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and uh, call this meeting of the Monroe County Council to order for Tuesday, May 10th. Um, I'd like to note for the record that not every council member is in person today. So I will call roll for those who are here. And then I will call roll for those who are on joining us online. Uh, Councillor Munson. Here. Councillor Deckard. Here. Uh, Councillor Crossley. Here. Councillor McKim. Present. Councillor Hawk. Present. And online, Councillor Iverson. Here. Great, we can hear you. Good. Um, I'd also like to note um, that today's a sad day uh, for county government. We lost one of our longtime beloved employees, uh, Susie Johnson, who's our county property administrator, passed away this morning. And she truly was a joy to everyone who worked with her. And um, I only met her a couple of times and she was amazing. She was, and she was talented at what she did. And you could tell she really loved her job. And so she's a great loss to our community and her extended family. And we, um, I'd like to just take a moment um, and remember her and honor her for just silence for a few minutes. Okay, Susie's viewing and funeral will take place um, this Saturday, uh, the 21st, uh, at 3 p.m. at the First Church of God located in Bedford, Indiana. So now we will move back to our agenda and have the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Peter, I hope you had a flag available. I was uh, glad to use uh, yours and uh, the sentiment uh, shared. There you go. That'll work. Um, now it's time for public comment on items not on our agenda. Um, do we have any members of the public either here in the room or online who would like to make comment this evening? Does not appear so. Thank you for clicking that. Um, okay, so then we will move to the adoption of our agenda. Um, is there anyone on council who wishes to add or remove an item from the agenda tonight? Move we adopt the agenda as published. Second. Okay, we have a motion to approve the agenda. Um, we have to have a roll call vote for all votes this evening uh, with one person participating online. So could we do that, please? Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Wilts? Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Hawk? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Um, next up is department updates. Um, are there any departments here to tell us fun things? Welcome, Bree. Good evening, Council. My name is Brianne Gregory. I'm the County oh. Financial Director. We is that better? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. Okay, um, just a couple of things tonight for you. Um, as most of you know, we finally completed the 2020 audit. So that's very exciting news. We received a clean opinion, which is also wonderful. Um, 
This audit was different from most as the State Board of Accounts contracted this out to an outside firm. So um, it was a learning experience for all involved. Um, and moving forward, um, it, it looks as though we're going to have be contracting with this outside firm moving forward. So a different firm, but outside of the SBOA. So, so anyhow, um, we know a little bit more about what to expect and um, you know, we'll continue working hard and um, getting these good audits. Um, and then with FEMA, I finally was able to connect um, with a FEMA representative and um, our funding, um, our reimbursement funding has been obligated. It's still sitting with the state, but um, good news is that it is coming. They've promised that. So um, we should be receiving soon $680,482.36. So um, that's of course um, the total reimbursement um, is the $723.84. We've already received 44,000. So. Yeah, exciting news there. Um, yeah, that's just about it for now. I just wanted to give you those exciting updates and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have them. Well, thank you very much. The, I sat um, in on the, the audit closeout yeah. meeting and it was obvious that they were impressed with your office and your work. So congratulations. Well, thank really you. Great. Are there any questions from council? Yeah. Is the audit report actually public yet? Has it been approved? Um, we signed everything and I was told it would be published that day. However, I have not received the official okay from the State Board of Accounts, so okay. I need to confirm. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, well, thanks for having me, Council. Thanks for visiting. Are there any other departments who'd like to play with us? Ms. Shell. Good evening, Council. Um, I wanted to publicly introduce to you our part-time administrative assistant. She's gonna be working with me. Uh, her name is Lindsay Hughes. Um, she'll be helping me uh, with uh, budget, budget stuff. She's, uh, I currently have her working on the elected officials questionnaire information. Um, we have a couple huge projects with regards to job descriptions. Um, because all the job descriptions got approved, they also needed to be signed by the employees. And so we're in the process of printing all the signed ones out so that we can get them into their personnel files. So that's, that's quite a job right there. So she's going to be helping me with that. Um, working with Elizabeth, trying to make sure that they get into, you know, the, uh, employee files. Um, so we have several things going on. And so I've tried to not overwhelm her. So far, she's <laughs> taken it like a trooper. So. <laughs> but this is only day two. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Lindsay. We're really glad to have you. Um, I was one of the folks who got to interview with you. And so we're really excited to have the skills that you have come into and help our office. Um, any other comments? I'm so excited to get started on projects. Very, very cool. Thank I, you. I have one other thing. Okay. I, um, I just wanted to officially let you guys know that I'm getting ready to just start distributing some uh, pre-budget um, uh, forms out to the departments. So I'm to that point right now. I've, I've got her started on things. So I'm going to be concentrating on some budget stuff and that information is going to be going out shortly. So, and I believe I owe you some homework that I had. Yes, I, I am hearing what you're saying. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Are there any other department updates for this? Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll move to council liaison updates. Are there any council members who have information to share? No, not this time. All right. That brings us to uh, item number seven on the agenda. And um, I would like to invite Commissioner Penny Giffins, along with Councilors Munson and Iverson, to speak tonight regarding a preschool readiness program that they have been involved with putting together.
This is Sojourn House first. Is that correct? No, it's no, the preschool. Pre preschool. First. Okay, sorry. I came prepared for two different items. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Councillor Munson and Councillor Iverson and I have been meeting with um, individuals associated with the Community Foundation in Bloomington and Monroe County about the preschool situation here and childcare here in Monroe County. Um, COVID has done its number on childcare issues. And so there is demand for getting kids ready for kindergarten. So what uh, Jennifer Meyer of the Community Foundation um, has done is she's reached out and she has been able to identify places where kids could have sort of an experience that would get them ready for kindergarten. I, I called an enhancement for kindergarten. And it would be a few weeks before they actually start kindergarten. One of them will be in Ellettsville. It's being run by the Boys and Girls Club out there. Um, and they are looking to do just, um, I don't know what to call it, just an, an incredible preschool experience for these kids. They'll be there um, multiple hours a day. They're gonna be teaching them social skills and, and uh, school readiness skills. They are looking to do this for 20 kids and that's in addition to some of the kids that have been going to their, their preschool program out there already. So high demand. Um, then also MCCSC is offering a program for three weeks prior to the start of kindergarten again, like the exact three weeks beforehand. The kids will be there from nine till four, which would be the typical hours that they would be there if they're there for a full day. Um, and so it's, it's just, again, a lot that we need to go over, but the MCCSC kids, what they need is at one of the locations and they're offering it at six out of the seven uh, elementary schools that have Title I students in them. And at one of the schools, they don't have quite the funding they need for supplies and for food for the kids. So I'm here today to ask that the council consider supplying $26,965.25 um, to the Boys and Girls Pro Club program out in Ellettsville and a total of $15,731.10 to the MCCSC program. And I don't know if Jennifer Meyer is online. She was, she intended to be. Um, she may have a lot more to say about this, but again, this is because of COVID. These kids have been impacted in ways that other kids haven't in the past. And Jennifer can tell you also that there are approximately 100 kids in this area waiting for child care. Yes. And so there's a high demand that we can't meet right now. So um, I don't know if you want Jennifer to, to chime in here or how you want to sure, proceed. That would be fantastic. If, um, that's sure. sure, let's hear from Jennifer then. She is the she is the expert in this program. Welcome. Hi, hi everyone. Thank you. Um, thanks, Penny, for bringing this to council. Yes, we've been involved in a series of conversations, um, really just trying to paint the current landscape of early childhood within our community, um, and diving into just you know the current needs that COVID has. Um, that those cards that COVID has dealt with families, uh, particularly the vulnerable children um, within our community. Those are families that are currently on the Head Start wait list, which is very long and was long very early, which is something that we have not been accustomed to dealing with within our community. Um, certainly um, um, an effect that COVID has had. So over a hundred families are on the, the Head Start wait list. Um, similarly, we find that um, Compass um, Early Learning Center that's in Crestmont area that also serves a vulnerable population. Uh, families are over 100 on that wait list. And um, when we look at the wait list in our Title I Community School Corporation within Monroe County Schools, we see the very same over 100 families. Um, many of you know that uh, Richland Bean Blossom just opened a child care center. And within um, the few days of opening that center, they also have a wait list that's uh, quite numerous as well. Um, so while we're seeing that um, COVID has certainly impacted the ability to secure seats, um, especially among those that need it the most, we're also seeing that the current landscape of our providers along the line of the shortage of childcare workers um, is also 
coming into play as well as that um, our child care centers are not able to run full capacity currently um, due to the shortage of workers. Um, so ultimately, all this to say that when, um, when children enter kindergarten this fall, we can easily say that without a doubt, around 100 kids were for certain will enter without a formalized childcare pre-K experience. Um, and so really addressing this as a community of how can we step in and, and start to fill this gap. Um, and so really been um, um, thankful for the conversations that we've been able to engage with, with some of the commissioners and, and really happy to see that this is going before you this evening. Thank you. Um, May I add too that this is very time sensitive given uh, the, the schedule that we're on. And so the MCCOC program, like I said, would start, I think it's July, the, no, the RBB would start July 11th. And I think the MCC one starts at around the same date. So that means we've got to move fast. The other thing that Community Foundation has offered to do is that if council is willing to provide this funding, they will step up and provide the interim funding and then we can reimburse them. So I really appreciate that offer on their part. Yes, that's amazing. Um, did you have, I know it was a three, oh, look, Mr. Iverson, would you like to, to talk about this project? Uh, if if uh, Council Member Munson would like to speak first, I certainly want to give her that opportunity. Go ahead. Well, so what I'd like to say is that uh, Councillor Munson has really shown leadership on this issue. Uh, it is really amazing that uh, she has been able to coordinate a lot of uh, the, the major folks here in our community to make sure that uh, we can tackle this issue. And uh, really wanted to also thank Tina Peterson and Jennifer Myers uh, for their work on this. And I think council, one of the things that you don't see tonight is just the vast amount of work that's been gone uh, done to outline the different options available to our community to address early child care needs, but then also to detail uh, budgets to make sure that we're being responsible stewards with the, the funds given to us. And at the same time, we're able to invest in areas where we can have tremendous impact. And I think that uh, Commissioner um, Githens was absolutely correct. This is an area where we can have a lot of impact in our community by making sure that children uh, are able to to learn and are ready for kindergarten. So I'll stop there, but it certainly has uh, my support. Thank you. Council Munson. I would like to add just a few things. Uh, first of all, this is the first project that is um, geared for ARPA funding, ultimately, uh, where the commissioners and council have worked uh, together as a team and it was great to work with Commissioner Githens and especially great to be able to have a partnership with the Community Foundation of Bloomington and Monroe County. Um, without them, I'm, I don't think uh, Monroe County government would have been successful in putting something together, certainly not with the speed with which this is coming together. Uh, one of the important points that I think for the council to know is that we have discussed other uh, early childhood education and child care uh, components that are really needed in our community. Mm -hmm. And there is not a rush to get these going right away. So um, we are focusing on what we need to do um, most immediately. But coming to you all uh, will be proposals to uh, help fund actual facilities for uh, child care. And those, uh, what we're talking about now is uh, uh, a possibility at Ivy Tech, which would be truly amazing yes. for uh, the students there. And also uh, assistance for the nest, which is filling a huge need in our community. Uh, another component, uh, that I think will have long lasting effects is to continue the, the kindergarten jumpstart in MCCSC and RBB um, in, in future years, which we may be able to do with <coughs> endowment funding uh, to set up uh, 
a way to help staff these and provide supplies in future years. So the, this is not the last you all will hear about <laughs> this. So tonight we are just focusing on the immediate uh, uh, program for MCCSC and RBB. I'm actually really glad to hear you talk about it being part of a bigger effort because that is what I think we've said. <laughs> Some of us have talked about repeatedly wanting to see ARPA um, make a, a bigger splash on mm -hmm. some of these um, really important issues. So that's that's good to hear. Um, questions? Yes, Councilor McKim. Yeah, thanks. I just, I wanna make sure I understand the numbers. So the, the 200,000, there's a $200,000 number in the uh, in the narrative, but then the two numbers that we, we heard were more like what, 26,000 and 15,000. And I guess I, I wanted to make sure, are those those two numbers that we heard here in the presentation of those, in addition to the 200,000, is the idea that uh, I, guess, I guess could somebody just address the uh, yes. kind of put those numbers in context so, just so we understand the nature of the requests that will actually be coming for uh, before us? Will it be for two hundred thousand, right. or will it be for the twenty six thousand and fifteen thousand? So I think Commissioner Giffins wants to speak to this, but uh, as to how we manage funding, mm -hmm. I hope we will hear also from. Uh, uh, the auditor's office and Gregory too. Well, I'm, we're here tonight to ask for just for the funding for this school year. Mm -hmm. The other may be used later on, but this is, we, we had to have a placeholder to get on your schedule. <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay. right. I mean, literally. Yeah. Um, so, so that tonight we're asking for something approaching 42,000. If, okay. if that right. makes a difference, if that's a little easier to, to yeah. get moving on. <laughs> Thank you. And, right. and then, so just to, to continue, um, so it sounds like, so I, and, and I, I know that this has been mentioned by several of you that this would be ARPA. I know the narrative initially said rainy day, and I just wanna make sure that we're, we're all clear that at least I, I would prefer that that be ARPA. I think that yes. ARPA funding makes, makes a lot more sense. And I certainly support this, uh, this request. Um, do any of my colleagues disagree that it should not be, think that it should not be ARPA funding? Uh, I would like us to hear from uh, Brian Gregory be, because um, there is some fluidity with, uh, with respect to how ARPA funding uh, can be managed. And we need to be, we need to be educated, Ms. Gregory. <laughs> sure. So um, I spoke with Cheryl a little bit earlier today and, you know, we're definitely, we can be flexible. Um, you can, you know, set up um, plan for this to come from ARPA, but now if there, you know, if this needs to move forward quickly, um, and you, you know, don't have time to go through the ARPA channels, we could always correct the expense later. Um, so we could add it to the plan, appropriate it, and then, you know, remove it from wherever you um, appropriate it today into ARPA. So however you want to handle it. Wait a minute, hang, hang on. We're, we're not actually voting on an appropriation no. today. No, no we so are not. That hasn't been advertised. No. So it, there's time to do right. Right. to right. take it out of ARPA, isn't right. there? Right. We wanted to discuss it and get a sense of the support. And we didn't have time to advertise for an additional appropriation, regardless of the fund source. So, um, and to be honest, the number, uh, the inflated number in the agenda just came from, they were still pulling together exactly yeah, no, what they were asking. That's, fine. Yeah. Okay. That, that's so, cool. Yeah. Uh, yes, this uh, uh, was on our list, our project list yeah. of what we wanted to do. Yeah. So I think it's it's time to just make sure we get it out of ARPA. I don't think it's appropriate to take it anyplace else, uh, but certainly that is a part of what our goal is. Uh, more to the point, being the mother of a teacher uh, of the fifth grade, She's really worried about those students who are coming in to third grade who missed two years of very, very important learning challenge during that time. So that by the time they get up to fifth grade and they've lost their third and fourth grade uh, education, they get to fifth grade and they are not ready. Uh, and so I think this has got to be something I don't, that's not the county's responsibility, that's the school's responsibility, but I think there has to be something to look at those kids that really uh, miss that 
important two years. And I just want to uh, make sure we understand the timeline. If this is advertised tomorrow, how soon can we actually vote on the appropriation? In October. So um, it can't be advertised tomorrow. We can't, it, we have to, we could send it in and it could be advertised for the 18th, which would then put it at the first week of May. No. We're in June. the first week of May. June or June, sorry, <laughs> first week of June. So we we are getting ready. We're doing um, additional appropriation requests right now uh, for the June 14th. So if we have it by the 23rd, we can have it at the June 14th meeting. So is that <laughs> soon enough for the program or do we need to find some other solution and scramble? I don't think we're allowed to do like a reimbursement back from fund to fund. Wasn't there a rule? Well, I, I, our auditor's thought... auditor representative told us we could, but we still would need to be advertised at some. We still have to advertise. Yeah. It's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I wouldn't mind if Jennifer weighed in again, but it's my understanding that as long as we are sure that the funding will be approved, that like I said before, the community foundation will front the money and yeah. um, help make sure that these two programs happen. One of the other things that I forgot to mention earlier too is that this goes across the whole county. When we're doing stuff yes. in Ellettsville and doing stuff in MCCSC, yep. we are serving everybody. And I'm, I'm really tickled that Jennifer was able to put it together this way. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Thank you uh, for the previous questions and the comments. And I appreciate very much this coming here. This is a very non-traditional way that the county uh, can take some action to do some things to be exceedingly helpful for a really pivotal time in the development of these particular students. Every parent in this county knows when you look for pre-K opportunities and or child care, it is a walking pneumonia disaster. It is hard. It is competitive. It is gut-wrenching. And for people that love their children, and I think that's everyone that has them, my heavens, it's awful. And if we can do anything to mitigate efforts at that and turn this into a longer term thing, more power to us and more power to that. You know, in the back, in a vacuum, things will start to fill in and this is a good opportunity to jump, to jump in that vacuum because that system is absolutely grueling. And I say that as a parent who went through that, that is grueling those families and the pandemic was 10 times grueling beyond that so if it helps to verbalize that support for the people preparing and planning count me in on that voice actually have a, a couple of questions so um thank you to commissioner githens and the colleagues on county council that worked on this because as a mom of three and one actually being in um kindergarten when COVID hit and feel like she's just missed a lot. Uh, I, I think this would definitely help some of the PK um, kids that are coming in. But a couple of um, the question is, I know you have mentioned in the report um, that six out of seven elementary schools will be a part of it. I'm just out of curiosity, which elementary school is left out? I may have heard that and I'm sorry, I I, I've forgotten. It's the title, six out of the seven title one elementary schools. And they're also, right. MCC, I forgot to mention is providing the transportation for this, which is also a big what, thing. I'm sorry, what they're did you just They're providing the transportation also for this so that the kids will be picked up. MCCSC is? MCCSC for the, the that, that program That was one here. of my questions is if there was gonna be transportation provided. So that's, that's good. Okay. Um, Ms. Myers, did you have, are you unmuted? And I just wanted to make sure, did you have an, uh, an, something to add for that question? I was just gonna say that all the Jumpstart will be offered at every single Title I community school where, where the gap and the shortfall lands is in the funding to secure because of the regional mapping of the funds. It left out Clear Creek as far as the ability to secure money for food. 
So that is what you'll notice in the budget is that we're asking for but, uh, uh, a budget for food with Clear Creek, but the transportation will happen at Clear Creek. Across the board, Jumpstart will be at every single one of the elementary uh, Title I schools. Okay. Thank you for correcting me. Um, and this is, so this would start July 11th through, I'm assuming like right up through school. Okay. And it's Monday through Friday. Yes. And also, um, it's at the schools as much as possible that the students will be attending later on. So they'll get familiar with that school so that the day they walk in the door, they're going to be more comfortable. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, the MCCOC used to have this kind of program going and then it lapsed for several years. And so this is a way to get it going again and with experienced teachers in those buildings, I think it's really gonna add to the success of these kids. Yeah. I do have a question um, about the staffing. Are, are we, is it teachers who will be staffing this? Is that the anticipated? I'm yes. Yeah. Okay, yes. even at the Boys and Girls Club? Yes, and at the Boys and Girls Club, they're gonna be doing two hours a day of academics. So at that time, they'll have two teachers plus two assistants with the kids. And then after the two hours of, of strict academics, then the one teacher will leave, but there'll still be a teacher and two assistants there throughout the day so that they'll be working on those social skills. They'll be working on sort of getting familiar with the school. They'll be working on some of the, you know, how is it appropriate to play tag if you're here kind of things, <laughs> you know? Uh, but they'll be doing arts and crafts and things to, that make the kids enjoy coming to school. It takes away some of that fear too that sometimes little ones have. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I, I'm not sure if this was in the, in the packet, I might've missed it, but um, in terms of measuring outcomes, because I know that this is going to be kind of a hopefully ongoing thing, like Ms. Munson was saying. Are there any measurements put in place? Have you gotten? I know it's really hard to pull that together quickly, but uh, Jennifer, I don't know of anything that's put into place to do a measurement. Do you? Um, so through Jumpstart, they'll do some pre-assessments and posts, so we should be able to get some outcome measurements in that. As we are thinking about the Boys and Girls Club, it gives us some um, opportunities as writing up the curriculum to make some assessments that align, so that'll be essential. And are, are most of the, I guess most of the desired outcomes are around social skills as much mm -hmm. as anything else. Well, social so. skills, but also some of the the pre-K skills that you expect to kids to come in with. You know, they expect kids to be able to count and to be able to identify their alphabet and things like that. So it's just reinforcing things that kids may not have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they really do yeah. have a, a, a curriculum set up for the kids. Sounds really great. And, and certainly addressing a need, so thank you. Well, I also have to compliment the Boys and Girls Club. And when COVID started, that's when I first met Jennifer and got in touch with some of the understanding what was going on here. And Boys and Girls Club stepped up to take care of all those essential workers, the kids of those essential workers. They figured out ways through pods and other systems. They quickly geared up with thermometers and all kinds of things to make sure that the mm -hmm. children of those essential workers had a place where they could safely go. So uh, kudos to Boys and Girls Club too. Absolutely. Are there any other questions from council? Yes. Uh, I'd actually like to make a motion. Um, I move a sense of the council to support this program as presented from ARPA funding. Second. Second. And the purpose is to give community foundation something to hang their hat on if they want to advance, they can go on the record saying we support That's it. Awesome. Could, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. So if, thank you. If um, Councillor Iverson and Councillor Munson could work to make sure that the um, additional is requested so that we can get this accomplished, that'd be great. We will. Thanks. Thank you.
And now we move on to agenda Can number. I, yes. Commissioner Gibbons, could you send me the breakdown, please, of each of those uh, programs? Mm -hmm. And then that's all I need so I can get it advertised. I would be very honored to do that. Thank you. Um, now we're looking at item number eight. Um, so again, I invite Commissioner Gibbons to speak uh, regarding the Sojourn House project. I'm dutifully signing in here, okay? Absolutely, um, <laughs> thank you. Several months ago, I was out at the Ellensville Chamber of Commerce meeting and I heard um, Carissa Muncie speak about Sojourn House. It was the first time I'd heard about it. Carissa's here tonight with um, her compatriot, Amy. And um, I think this is something that sort of stays under a lot of people's radar, but they have developed an, not only an organization, but a facility to help women who've been trafficked. And I'm coming here before you tonight to ask for funding to help with the renovation of the property, which is the old Steinsville Elementary School, which means that we're reusing something in the community, uh, which I think is fabulous. Um, in the original request that's in your packet, they had asked for $130,000, but with the supply chain issues and the increased cost, um, it's now up to $164,000. And this is just for the renovation of the property and it's part of the renovation. Um, they've already obtained a lot number of grants that have taken care of part of the funding. The total funding for the re renovation was $393,552. So they're asking for less than half of that. And I would, I would comment too that, and I've talked with Carissa and Amy about this, during the time of COVID, trafficking went even more underground, which means that it's, it's even more pervasive out there and harder to touch. Um, and I'm gonna let them talk a little bit about it because it, it's their dream and they have made it a reality. So I'm gonna turn it over to them, but I'll be happy to come back up if I'm asked. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, my name is Amy Meek. So I'm one of the board of directors for Sojourn House. So Sojourn House um, exists to defend, restore, and liberate women who have been victims of human sex trafficking. And for our organization, we have started with phases to get this open. Opening a nonprofit during a global pandemic proves to be a little bit challenging. Um, so phase one is open of our program. We've hired a case manager who works with women in downtown Bloomington. She works in and with the other shelters in town. She meets with the women, she helps them with programming that will happen in-house once our facility is open. So now she's helping them learn boundaries and some job skills, helping them with housing and healthcare, things like that. Uh, my day job is as a nurse at IU Health and at, with the Monroe County Public Health Clinic. So I've been in that role for 11 years now and I have seen um, human trafficking and our streets in Bloomington only increase every year. And as a nurse for 25 years, I was shocked at how much of that happens in the public health scene. And until I moved into that role of nursing, I did not know anything about that. So that's something as COVID um, has hit, substance use has only increased. And with substance use, unfortunately, trafficking usually increases as well. Our next step is to get phase two open. So phase two is our residential program and that will be a 24 month program in Steinsville. Um, the women who live there can live there for up to 24 months and will go through pathways where they learn um, first just healing and which is gonna be lifelong. They learn education wherever they're at in their education level, we wanna increase that. They'll go through a sustainability period where they um, do all these things on their own, but still live with us so we can help them along the way. They'll pinpoint meaningful career opportunities and start down meaningful paths that way. And then eventually graduate the program where a case manager will follow them in the community to make sure they don't fall back into old habits um, and can sustain their life that we've helped them to, to get established. Um, I'll let Carissa talk a little bit more about the infrastructure that we're asking for. Hello, thank you for having us. Um, I'm Carissa Muncy and I'm also a board member and Amy um, and I founded Sojourn House based on what we were seeing in the community, women who, because of their lack of secure housing were vulnerable. And so what we identified is that housing is the most important key to the 
the stability and all the other things we want to add. And so we realized that with the closing of Steinsville Elementary School, we had an opportunity to use a beautiful historic building that's still so useful and sturdy and lovely and meaningful, but we could repurpose it and turn it into a place and a haven uh, of the two-year program that would bring these women hope and some future. And so we identified that an elementary school hallway um, is enough for all of the bedrooms and the, the kitchen and all, but we also have use of the entire school. And so we're renovating the back hallway into the housing and the rest of the school we can use <coughs> anytime we want, um, including the yard and the gardens and um, some of the entrepreneurial uh, development that that can lead to later. The building itself is old. Fortunately, our back half that we're renovating is the newest portion. It was only built in 1986. And so there is a lot that's already in place and it's going to be just fine, but we need to renovate in order to add more plumbing for up to 16 women living there at a time. We need kitchen plumbing and we have to expand the electrical capacity. Right now, uh, we have been working with architects to take the old scroll, yellowed scrolls and turn them into digital plans and get it all up to code. That's well underway and the state has approved variances. That's all going well. And uh, we've talked to the county commissioner of building and zoning and they are excited about the project. So we're happy to work with them too. The renovations include nine full bathrooms, uh, accessible, a full kitchen where the women can learn to cook and work together on that. And then the bedroom space has to be uh, safe and ready to live in. But the biggest, most expensive project is making sure it's fire safe. So we have to extend ceilings up to the roof line and all of that stuff that didn't make sense to me before, but now I know <laughs> that you have to have burn time and all of that. Um, and so that's a large part of the expense is the safety that we have to add to that building, which will benefit the entire building. Um, regardless of its use. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions? Yeah, Councilor Hawk. Right. My daughter went to grade school in that building. She mm -hmm. was bus from Ellisville over there. And it was, they take such beautiful care of that building. It really, it's amazing. And the people who live in Steinsville, they love that school building. So it's great as being used. I, I assume you have uh, support of the community. Uh, but the question I have, my real estate mind's working here, uh, who owns the building? The town owns the building okay. and the town is in full support of the use. Okay, so it would seem to me that what we need to be working with is the owner of the building uh, you know, maybe the legal department can work with us on this, but you know we we don't want to give you permission to go in and start working on someone else's building mm -hmm. uh, unless you have already have that lease right to do it. They've said you can do whatever you want to do, or do we have to run it by? Or it is all approved by the town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, it's all we've handled it with uh, our attorneys and. They're in support of every renovation that we have planned. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I just would like to make sure our legal department looks at, at it thoroughly and making sure that we're doing what we're supposed to be doing here, uh, not just to protect the county, but to protect you and Steinsville. So um, I wish you luck on this project. And I'm, I did wonder, that playground area that's just been renovated, yeah, they're so proud of, they did a great job of, of working on that. Uh, then will your space open up to that playground area? Yes, yes. In fact, mm -hmm. um, one of the neat features of having that playground area is that some of the women that will be serving as residential uh, clients will have children who are perhaps uh, being taken care of by other people, family members, or perhaps DCS, there may be an open case there. And so we'll be able to facilitate some really nice visitation out there, right there on the grounds, using the playground and the gymnasium um, so that women can work to reunification. There should be a space there where they might be able to work on a small flower garden or vegetable garden or something, which is always 
I, in my opinion, a good, healthy thing to do. We have a lot of long-term entrepreneurship opportunities there. And one of the, yeah. our goals is to have a community garden and a garden that the women really run, uh, but the community can be involved with as well and a farmer's market that we can start. So those are longer term goals. I believe that I've already seen uh, some comments from the Steinsville Town Board, but I would really encourage you to get an official vote from them that they are supporting this uh, so that we know we're supporting what Steinsville is supporting. We have it written in our lease. Um, yeah. with the town I board. Know. Sorry. The reason I keep turning my head there is I'm reading what you're saying. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we have it written in our lease for the renovations that we need to, to do with the town board. Hey, thank you. Um, Councilor Iverson, you have a question? Yes, I do. Thank you for being here tonight. And uh, my question uh, is centered around the, the sad fact that uh, trafficking is not necessarily a local issue, and I, I, I was asking, I want to ask uh, if you could uh, briefly talk about what you're doing and the partners you're working with across the state of Indiana and maybe even regionally to tackle the broader issue of, of trafficking. Um, so we have a community advisory board, and part of that board is a representative from ITVAP, which is Indiana Trafficking Victims Advocacy Program. So that's kind of our state liaison for trafficking, and we they've been super helpful with us in getting up and going. Uh, we have partnered with agencies, um, one in Oklahoma called Branch 15, one in um, Louisville called um, Scarlet Hope, uh, the Hope Center in Indianapolis, uh, we went to a training in Thistle Farms in Nashville, Tennessee, and all of these organizations we've been able to sit down with. Um, they've given us their policies, their procedures, the how they got going, the what not to do's so that we can avoid some of the traps that maybe they fell into when they opened up their facilities. And, um, you know, this is a, a space that everyone who works in it is just supportive of each other. So it's been very easy to make those partnerships and, and have that help. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I have a few questions, and I, I've actually been over there to the elementary. I don't think I've been at your part, although I saw some of the supplies coming in at the time, a lot of shoes. There were tons of shoes in those hallways, and they told me, well, these are going to do great things. Uh, my question for you, that building is very near and dear to me, um, not for any special reason other than the fact that I, I know it's special the community in those places are awesome. Um, because the building is used for so many different things, help me to understand, is your portion going to be, or is it partitioned from the other areas? Like my understanding is I could do a wedding in other portions of the building. Is your, is your portion partitioned or using parts of the old cafeteria? What can you tell me about that? Sure. So we've worked alongside our contractor and architect to design the partition that would actually separate our hallway so that it'll be secure. There'll be a, a partial wall, you know, holding in a door, however you say that in real construction terms. But, um, and then we've worked with security company to install alarms. And so nobody who shouldn't be down there. So if you are there for a wedding, you'd be stopped right at the door and couldn't get in. Okay. That will be secure. That, that, that's awesome. And I, I appreciate that. And I, I need to get back over there to see the other portion mm -hmm. of the building, but um, that's helpful to know. I know it's got proximity to the police station, uh, which I think you also want a partition from because of their, the stuff they need and they keep and, and all of that. So thank you very much for being here. I haven't been to Steinsville in a couple of years, but I will come see you. I'm interested in the uh, programs that you're providing and uh, the work opportunities for the women who will be living, living at the facility. How are they gonna handle transportation, both for training and for, for work opportunities? So, so transportation, we recognize it's one of the biggest hurdles if you're in Steinsville. <laughs> um, we have a, very large volunteer network already. And we've been training, we have levels of training of joggers, marathoners, and, and sprinters. Um, so our joggers and marathoners are the, the 
volunteers that are vetted heavier and background checked and will work more directly with the women. So we have a list of volunteers who will be helping women with transportation when that's necessary. Uh, we'll also be utilizing all of the, you know, for medical transportation, all the things that anyone else who lives in science will can utilize. Mm -hmm. um, but part of that, you know, as they work along the pathways and get into jobs and sustainability, part of that is purchasing their car and taking mm -hmm. themselves where they need to go. So that's part of the pathway. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> If I could add, we've also talked to several corporations that are very excited to welcome women into their entry level positions and beyond, depending on their education. Uh, so the the opportunities for employment, um, are, that's one of the most wide open and promising portions of this is the outpouring of um, willingness from our community to hire the women that we are helping out. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was, you just touched on something that I wanted to ask because I'm looking at the website right now, which seems very detailed of the organization um, and the program because it says um, a residential 24 month program will allow time for each woman to find healing freedom and a so solid support system. So um, I, I was just curious to see like once the 24 month program is done for the individual, I guess, what is, Obviously, the goal is for them to be removed from the situation, but um, I just wanted to see, like, what else would you help with them? So as they move out, and and that'll look different for each woman. So up to twenty four months, you know, depending on the situation, okay. they've got children they're getting reunified with that might be mm -hmm. a little quicker for that person than it is the other person. Um, but when they move out the a case manager will be assigned to them in their non-residential uh, area, just like we have a case manager now at Southern Residential, who will meet with them at least monthly to make sure that the rent's getting paid, job's going okay, and things are going well for them. Um, you know, we hope to have survivors that eventually after they've gone through the program can be added back then to our board or to our advisory board and in roles like that. Awesome, thank you. I'll just make kind of make the same comment I did with the previous presentation. I, I look forward to supporting this. I uh, hope it will be advertised uh, for the ARPA, uh, ARPA fund, but um, very much looking forward to this. You guys did a great job. May I, I add one or two things also? Um, this will be adding infrastructure to Steinsville. This will perhaps be creating citizens that will choose to stay in Steinsville. When Amy and Carissa talk about entrepreneurship, there could be entrepreneurship that remains in Steinsville. We could help rejuvenate that town with this small program. When you think about it, compared to everything else that's going on, this is relatively small in terms of the things that we could do with all the ARPA funding. So I think it meets the infrastructure needs. I think it speaks to the fact that there are problems due to COVID and there are all kinds of positive, wonderful things I can see coming out of this. And so I'm really, I really am excited that you're willing to support this. Thank you. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, according to our documents, it's discussing using the rainy day funds, but that's not what we're suggesting, right? We're talking ARPA funds. Again, it's the same situation as the last item. Um, I, I think that I prefer ARPA funds, but that was a point of discussion. I would support it if it's under if ARPA. If it's under ARPA? Yes. Okay. That's what I Does anyone not think ARPA is the good source for this one? Okay. Good. And um, again, what we would need to do since this did come along rather quickly and we couldn't advertise for an additional appropriation is the same process, which is get it advertised so that we can do an official vote um, at our next meeting. But would you um, would you want to make a motion to, I don't know what you called it. But well, well the, re the reason why I did it for the previous, because there was another organization that was going to be money. fronting the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that was needed. And so that was kind of a special case. Okay, all right. So you're just going to have to look at our smiles and know that in a month, we're still smiling. We're a smiley bunch. Well, 
Um, but we can get it on the June regular session. Is that correct? Well, what that I would correct. also suggest, Madam President, that since the commissioners had originally brought this to us, suggesting we use rainy day, if they, as a group, support doing it out of ARPA so that we're not working against ourselves here. I see. Yeah, right. I think that um, we had set it up so that commissioners make ARPA requests as a group. Is that what you're implying? Well, they'd have to amend the plan anyway. So the commissioners will have to take some action, yeah. which they can do, I guess, at any of their meetings to add it to the ARPA plan. And then, but that shouldn't add a delay. I mean, they can do that I don't think that should do that either. Right? They can do right. that simultaneously. Does that make sense to you, Jen? Yes, we, we meet weekly, so... We're you you need to use the microphone, sorry. 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 Yes, we meet weekly, so our hands aren't tied as much uh, in terms of what we're, we're able to do and how quickly we can do it. Right, okay. So I just want to make sure things are in place to keep it moving forward. Sounds like it is. And we look forward to hearing back from you so that we can vote on the appropriation. Thank you for being here. And I will again forward to Michelle the budget that I was given. Thank you. Great. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Oof. We are on to item nine and um, another ARPA topic. <clears throat> Council, I move to approve the ARPA request for an additional appropriation in fund 89500000 American Rescue Plan Act in the amount of $60,000 in the services category. Second. So we have um, my name and Mr. Cockrell's name on here. I'll let uh, Jeff take the lead on telling us about this, but I'm happy to jump in. Okay, um, and I think this probably isn't news to any of you. Um, we have this as part of our ARPA plan already. I'm kind of the third item for that yeah. tonight. <laughs> um, this is, as, as you also should know, we have a criminal justice response committee, which was formed with the memberships of both the council and the commissioners to talk about items in the criminal justice report. You know, and I think early on in their meetings, they determined that really need some administrative support and staff support for that to help organize uh, the committee itself, but, but also to help do the outreach for community groups so that they can attend these meetings and give input as necessary and when uh, their areas of expertise were going to be talked about. Um, at last late fall, early winter, a request for uh, essentially a, applicants for this contractual position went out. Um, and at that point in time, the, the dollar figure in this is, is 60,000. That was included in that packet of information that went out to contractors. Uh, we'd really like to get a contractor hired and in place so that these meetings can continue and, and progress forward. It's, it almost feels like they're at a, in a holding pattern until they get this position filled. I think we've talked about it as it went through the ARPA process, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you need. Thank you, that uh, does sum it up. And um, I just add that uh, Councilor Iverson, Councilor Parsley, and I are the council members on the Criminal Justice Reform Committee. So it's um, an item that has been discussed in that committee with the commissioners and um, brought with my name on it, but certainly with the support of the entire committee. Did you have something? Um, Commissioner Thomas said, stated that she can jump in if you need her in, through chat. Oh, great, great, thanks. Um, as I was saying, I think the commissioners are on board for this. And um, I was uh, asked to bring it to council um, as part of a, an ARPA request. Are there questions? No, I just wondered if I know that there was the application at one time for that intern that we had last year that was so tremendous, uh, saying that he might like to return to Monroe County government. And I wondered if this would be a good spot for him to, if, if a lot of this is arranging meetings and so forth, uh, that he might be able to assist somewhat in that. Uh, you know, that would be up to the legal department, but. When I was reading this, I thought, wow, Keith's real good at those things. We already know that. And he knows county government. So he might be able to assist with this. My understanding is he's a student still. 
is he a student still? Right, he just wanted to at the summer yeah. internship I as see. he did last year. Yeah, okay. But yeah. I mean, I was just throwing that out just because I just happened to think of it just now when I was reading the description, I thought, because what this also says, it's just 60,000 to begin with, but they expect this to, you know, grow. So I'm thinking if there's some way that an intern could help arrange meetings that would free up the, the consultant with those things. I'm just throwing out that suggestion. Okay. <laughs> Probably everyone's already thought of that. Do Sorry, I'm, I'm late to the party. Not a problem, not a problem. Um, any questions from council down this way? Any questions? Councilor Iverson has his hand raised. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to say two things. First of all, I think uh, Mr. Cockrell has it absolutely correct that the process is a little stalled at this point and that this administrative support is certainly needed. And the second thing I would add is that the community can find the reports uh, that this uh, request talks about on the Monroe County's uh, website. And uh, you can find not only the detailed reports, but also some of the summary documents uh, that would be helpful for the public to read in advance of, of future sessions where we're soliciting uh, public comment. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Thomas, did you want to say anything about the, the issue? Um, I, I just want to say thank you for hearing this and uh, we support it. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Sure thing. Um, if we don't have any questions, I'm going to go ahead and call for the public comment. Public comment. That's what I'm going to call for because I always remember to do that. <laughs> Is there any public comment either online? I see one person with their hand raised. Uh, hi, Jim Shelton, welcome. Good evening, Council. Jim Shelton speaking right now, just as a CASA. I urge you to approve this. Uh, I've been a CASA now for nine and a half years. Every case I've had has involved addiction. I have a case right now that involves severe mental health problems as well as addiction. Uh, I've had uh, a number of cases where reentry services have been an issue. And quite frankly, I agree with the assessment I've heard several times that things seem to be kind of stalled. I believe the last several meetings, in fact, have been canceled. So yeah. I think uh, this is a very important effort. And quite frankly, so does the Chamber of Commerce. We advocated for the funding to do the study way back all along. And I think we're much more likely to be successful if we have this kind of support. And quite frankly, I hope this kind of leadership. We have somebody who every day when they wake up, this is sort of what their uh, job is to try to make progress. And I think this is really, really important. And we have the opportunity to make things a lot better, not just for the individuals involved, but for their children. And uh, I think this is really important. So I urge you to approve it. And I applaud you bringing it up and to the commissioners for bringing it up. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Seeing none, now we can have a roll call vote. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor McCam? Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. This is exciting. And I have heard that um, a contract is actually on the agenda for Wednesday. Wednesday, that's tomorrow. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay, moving right along. All right, that'll be exciting. Um, our next item is item number 10. Council, a move to approve the commissioner's request for a fund to fund transfer of cash of 260,000 from fund 1186 Zero 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 rainy day to fund one two one five zero 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 election fund and simultaneously approve and fund one two one five zero zero six eight the creation of account line three zero 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 six contractual with an additional appropriation of two hundred sixty thousand in the services category. Second. So this item was tabled from the last meeting. And um, it's like you have the honor of talking to us about it. I, I do. And if I don't know if Greg's on the 
Zoom link or not, but if not, well, then I, I'm, I'm your guy for all the information. Um, this is essentially costs associated with the election central at the Walnut Street uh, facility. Um, as of the time of request, we had, we had spent $149,289.51 in uh, rehabbing the place to make it workable for the primary election. Uh, there are approximately another $50,000 um, $30,500 to $50,000 estimate for additional work that still needed to be done. Um, in addition, uh, this, this building was purchased by the county through innkeeper's tax. It had been collecting and generating revenue uh, that helps pay off the bonds for our uh, convention center. So the, the included in this request is, in a, is a, a monthly payment of $4,800 to make up that gap in lost revenue for the convention center. Okay. Do we have questions from the council members on this topic? Yes. Yeah, and I, I certainly have no problem with the expenses themselves. They were necessary and actually the vote, voting in the Napa building was a, a great experience and the, the, the election board and the clerk's office did a fabulous job. But just as far as the, the funding goes, I guess I'm not understanding why we need to do that transfer. I mean, I'm looking at the, at the 4B and I mean, that, that, that fund has a $600,000 operating balance listed. Is that not uh, current? Because I, I, I think we could just strike the, um, the, the transfer, just do the appropriation. And then if we need to, we can adjust the levy when we do rates and levies for the next budget. Right. But there's, there's, we're not depleting that fund. There's, there's right. money in that fund. I, I see the auditor's representative nodding. And, the, and, and they, this doesn't include, uh, if you look at the cash balance now, it does not include that June settlement that they'll be receiving. Um, so I think we we better start watching real closely when somebody says, oh, let's do it on a rainy day. <laughs> we just smack that down. <laughs> Gotta watch it. My only response to that is I did reach out to the clerk who indicated that that, that would potentially create a hardship for her. Well, nah. I, I guess I'd like to understand a little bit more why, because like I said, I'm, I'm just I'm just looking at the numbers. I mean, the we'd still be giving the additional appropriation. If numbers don't work out, uh, we can do something later in the year, but it's, it's not necessary. We're doing an appropriation, additional appropriation, get this taken care of, they should be able to be okay. Now, what we've done is we're spending down that fund more than what we had, remember? We were supposed to be saving enough every year so that when we hit that presidential election year, it wouldn't be a hardship. We would be ready. Mm -hmm. Well, for some reason, whatever, we were advised to reduce the money going into that fund this year. And instead of going into that fund, it stayed over in general because we reduced the amount going there. So we need to adjust it next year anyway to get it back on track. Okay. So... Um... I would like just a confirmation from the auditor's representative, if, if that's okay with you. Um, because I, I did see the communication from the clerk that, that this was not a viable thing to do in her estimation. Yep. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have, I don't have the information in front of me, but I believe we kept, it's either 15 or 20% operating balance for that fund. So there's a, there's a healthy balance. I see. And I just checked the cash balance and it's, it's in good shape. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that's great. That's okay. all I need. Thank you, Bree. Um, and I would add that if you choose to, to go that route, there's nothing that would that I know of that short term would would run this into the red or anything like that. It would just they'd have to come back uh, presumably before the the general election this fall, mm -hmm. if okay. if if necessary. 
I guess I'm not even seeing why they would have to come back. I mean, we're just, we're adding this appropriation. Right. That's you should turn your mic on. Well, we'd have to change the motion. There's no reason why we but, can't. Yeah. But we'd have to change the motion. Yeah, council, I move that we amend the motion on the floor to strike the transfer, but leave in place the uh, additional appropriation. And proceed with the additional appropriation. Yeah, that's why I said it. Second. Um, Councillor Iverson. Oh. oh. Yeah, I, I think my comment's still germane given the motion on the floor okay. is that I just, I, <laughs> it's okay. Um, I just, uh, Councillor, well, it's to your point, I just want to make sure that we are touching base with the department and getting their feedback on, you know, the, the reason why we're making this motion and the reason why we're, you know, taking these processes and just, you know, it, it's, I just want to make sure that, you know, all of our, our T's are crossed and our I's are dotted here. Yes, me too. I just want to make it clear that that the the transferring in and out of rainy day and the depositing of cash in that fund is our job. Um, the the department's job, which the department is doing with excellent par excellence, is uh, is to request a budget and then execute that budget. And that's exactly what they've done. And we're giving them all the resources that they've requested to be able to do that that job. That's our job. Just make sure they have the money. Are there any other questions? Um, I have not on the not on the change, so I have questions for later. So let's. I just have a comment. Okay. Thank you very much. I <clears throat> what I would argue is that it as necessary and whatever we have to do to to supplement the election fund. I think that we either have to look at that down the road or listen to the elect uh, the department as they would request or ask for it. And I think with that understanding that we could move forward with this tonight in that way. Um, obviously with elections, difficulties with things, you name it. I mean, we've experienced it. We may have to adjust down the road anyway. So um, I don't have an objection to that as long as we have. And that's just how we do business anyway. Okay. Sir, do I do public comment? Is there any public comment on the amendment to the original motion? Seeing none, it could be vote on that amendment. On the amendment. Voting on, read, on the amendment. Read, well, well, no, okay. On the motion to strike the transfer request, but leave the additional appropriation amount in place. Hawk? Yes. Wiltz? Yes. Deckard? Yes. Crossley? Yes. Munson? Yes. McKim? Yes. Iverson? Yes. Motion passed on the amendment unanimous, seven to zero. Thank you. Um, I do have a question, and it goes to the fact that so the building was paid for you said out of innkeepers yes tax it had been rented to napa mm -hmm. um it had been sitting empty for a little while um, yes and then it was determined that it would be used for the elections mm -hmm. and you mentioned that we would be charging the election fund now rent is that to go into the innkeepers tax or cvc budget or I, I think it would be paid to the uh convention center so they could do their operations and and traditionally they've used those uh rental payments uh, in part to pay off pay down the debt and utilize that for that mm -hmm. support for that kind of payments and would that continue into the future? And I mean, is there like a an end date for that rent payment inter almost it's not interdepartmental, but you know, it does almost seem I, right. I think what we're looking at, and, and I think the agree the memo that I that I'll have the commissioners look at and, and hopefully approve has this as kind of a one-year snapshot um, because 
we want to see how that facility works. It seems it worked really well for the general election. I know that the election board had some concerns, um, whether that was that that facility, whether it was going to function as well as we all anticipated, or as as well as kind of the commissioner side of it anticipated, you know. And I think they didn't want to commit to a long term, longer term use of that building. I think. Well, I know that it's still purchased for the convention center expansion. And so if, if that gets moving, that would kind of oversee or you know, make that use more appropriate than, than the current use. This is kind of an interim use as those Got it. get resolved. So it could rent payment from the election fund to the convention center budget um, could continue until we do something else with that property. Right. And I think that's part of the conversations with you because we, it only continues if there's an appropriation into it. Um, so this is a, a request for kind of a one year um, use of that, use of that. So I, I guess potentially, but that would require another conversation with the council as well as the election board and the commissioners. Um, Madam President. Yes. Um, a few years ago, uh, this county rented buildings from to support county government in several different places. This is no different than that. Uh, we found a building, we wanted to use the building. We should have to pay for that building if we have a lease agreement with it. And so this would be no different than if we found another building that, you know, in any other place that we could use for this purpose. So it's, it's, it's legitimate. I believe for it's certain. legitimate. I'm anticipating pushback from some folks. And so I'm trying to make sure I've thought it through, yeah. but I do believe that it's legitimate. That's yeah, yeah. I agree. Um, my next question is not something that you necessarily know for sure, but to the best of your understanding, uh, does the election board or the clerk's office plan to utilize this building outside of election seasons? So early voting and voting times. To the best of my knowledge, I believe that there is some of the people working at the election who wishes to store the equipment um, there w during non-election times, but I'm not sure that's a final decision of the election board or the clerk. I see. Okay. So it could be, it, we could be keeping the equipment in that same spot, avoiding having to move it around. It, 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 it leaves open for that. In addition, as, as I think everyone knows, we have to, if we utilize that for the primary, we need to utilize it for the, for the so it really limits the ability for a, set, a third party to come in and right. utilize that building during that interim. Anyway. Right. But it frees up the spot where we maybe are storing mm -hmm. stuff previous. That's just, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. like, I got, I'm asking all the yeah. questions. Are there <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. I, I, not really a question. I just kind of want to reiterate my comment before about how uh, how well run this this last election was. I mean, everything just seemed to go so smoothly, both with the, the voting. All the voters I've talked to have said that it was a real pleasure to vote, uh, vote especially in the early voting center. The counting was, I mean, the, the results were were in right away, were very fast and accurate. And I, now yeah, was, this was a model election. With the I wish we had better. To, uh, with the exception of turnout, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, next time bigger turnout. But that's yeah. no, it was a very well yeah. run election. Yeah. Any other comments or questions from council? No. Okay. Uh, is there any public comment on this item, Ms. Thomas? Thank you. I won't keep you. Um, I just want to give a shout out to Greg Crone and Eric Evans. They did a lot of work under very challenging time constrained circumstances uh, to make that center work um, as well as it did. And, and I appreciate uh, Councillor McKim's comments. It worked really well, but there was a lot of effort that went on behind the scenes. And I just want to thank those two people for their hard work on making it happen. Thanks. Thank you. Any other public comment on 
the topic at hand. Okay, seeing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. And now we are on to item 11 with our health department. Council, I move to approve the health department's request for an additional appropriation and fund 81140000 annual survey in the amount of $1,000 in the services category. Second. It does look like uh, Penny Cottle from our health department is um, unmuted. So welcome, Penny. Good evening. Thank you. I will be quick. We do an annual report that is required to the Indiana Department of Health every year. In the last several years, it has been done as a survey. And that way, they really collect information from all of the county health departments. And we actually get some of that information back. So it, it's been a very good change. And this year, the Indiana Department of Health has awarded health departments who completed their annual survey on time, $1,000. And we did complete ours last week and we are wanting to appropriate these funds. I will say that originally the Indiana Department of Health has no, they don't care how we use the funds. However, they have awarded them through a federal grant. So there are some limitations to what we can do. So we do plan to have a staff retreat um, and use that to um, fund that, that staff retreat. Great. That's quite the uh, survey incentive, I have to say. I haven't yeah. come across that one. <laughs> That's terrific. Are there any questions from council for Ms. Cottle? No? Any public comment on the issue? Seeing none. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. Great. And do we have item B as well? Or is that? We do. Okay. Council, I move to approve the health department's request for a category transfer in fund 81819622 immunization long-term COVID of $34,106 from the supplies category to the services category. Second. And could you tell us a bit about this one? Yes. So we re we've received several different grants for COVID-19 and immunizations. And when we originally received these funds, we split the money between services and supplies because we didn't really know at the time what we would need. And as we are coming more towards the end of using those funds, we have not really needed the supply line. So we want to move it into services and that's really where we've been using most of those funds. So that has helped that, as you know, we uh, have an agreement, a partnership with IU Health for public health nursing and those funds have really helped us add uh, nursing staff and help have PRN staff as needed. Great. Yours are always so straightforward, thank you. Um, are there any questions or comments from council? Any public comments? All right, let's go ahead and have a roll call vote, please. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you all. Thank you. We're on item number 12 from the auditor's office. Council, I move to approve the auditor's request for an additional appropriation in fund 1000002 general fund auditor in the amount of $4,000 in the services category. Second. 
Kim, are you representing the auditor's office? Yes. Thank you. Um, with uh, the auditor was planning on encumbering some funds with regards to the postage needed. Uh, that didn't take place because of everything that was going on at year end. So this is an amount that she needs to be able to continue on with mailing out um, items. So other than that, that's all I know. So this is just to replenish the budget she thought she was going to encumber. So Right. Okay. Are there any questions from council? Are there any Do you have a question? Oh, I just, I mean, I, has anybody looked at those numbers to see, generally speaking, when someone's running a bit short, we just say, you know, transfer around within your budget and, you know, try to get yeah. through the year. Um, that, that is the way we're directed from the state and when we take our lessons, how to behave like a <laughs> county council. However, because otherwise we would be doing additionals all year long for people who didn't really need the additional. But I haven't looked at the budget. So who has that budget? Yeah. Do, do we have those numbers in front of us? I mean, how, how short are they on the... Uh, on the One within that whole category. Yeah. So. Where they could get the postage. I agree in general with Councilor Hawk that, that additional appropriation should happen late in the year uh, once departments have already transferred around. She has general fund. Uh, she currently has 150,000 in contractual that oh, has yet huh. to be used. Of unexpended appropriations. Uh, unexpended in the, in the services category. Council move we table this. Second. Indefinitely. Okay. Yes. Indefinitely. Yep. Yes. Does anybody have any comments to make about tabling? Any public comment on tabling? Let's have a vote. Do. Okay. Yeah. On the motion to table this item indefinitely, McKim? Oh, sorry. Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Munson? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Consider thyself tabled. So we will move to item 13 on our agenda from our council office. Okay. Council, I move to approve the request for a category transfer and fund 1000226 general fund probation of $198 from the personnel category to the capital category and simultaneously approve the creation of account line 40400 property loss. Second. This is a fun story. Um, well, first, I want to update on the, uh, you guys on the, <clears throat> sorry, on the amount. Um, the TV owner was provided a check for $211.86 as tax was included um, for the purchase of the TV. Hmm. Council, I move we amend the motion on the floor to change the amount transferred 
from $198 to $211.86. Second. Any questions about changing it? public comment on it so let's let's vote mm -hmm. okay 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 on the motion uh to amend the amount to 211 dollars and 86 cents councillor munson yes councillor deckard yes councillor hawk yes Councillor Crossley. Yes. Councillor Iverson. Yes. Councillor Wiltz. Yes. Councillor McKim. Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Okay. Would you like to give us a brief background on this? I, I can't. Um, so um, mid April, Judge Galvin authorized a search um, by juvenile probation of a home where a juvenile would be staying. Um, and during the search, one of the field officers was removing something from a closet and brushed up against a nightstand, which caused the flat screen TV that was sitting on the nightstand to fall forward. Um, after that happened, they plugged in the TV to see if it was functioning um, in the same manner that it was before it fell, and it was not. Uh, so we needed to help replace the TV for the homeowner. Um, we reached out to the State Board of Accounts to see if we could use the juvenile lit special purpose. Um, and they advised that we couldn't because that specific fund or um, revenue source is for the operation of a juvenile facility. And obviously this expense wouldn't fall into that. So with the guidance of State Board of Accounts, we came up with this plan of transferring um, the amount from probation general fund into a new property loss line so that um, the homeowner could receive uh, the cost for the TV. And I will note that um, we, the homeowner has already received a check. It came from unappropriated and I hand delivered it to her yesterday. Thank you for that. Are there any questions from council comments? I think this um, it seems to me it, it brings to mind something we need to cover, because if um, maybe the State Board of Accounts now will say, well, you're really not supposed to be doing probation out of that fund. Uh, it's not in that facility. There was a, hmm. a big discussion about that when we did that. And I thought that it meant that the probation officers would have to be in the facility because that's the way the legislation reads. But then it was like, oh no, we can just do it wherever. So now what if this was a larger expense? So it, I just think we need to make certain that we are, that State Board of Accounts is on board with what we're doing. And, and indeed, if this had been a bigger loss, but what are we, what is our plan to cover this kind of thing in, in the future. I didn't know we'd had a problem like this. Turn, turn your mic on. Sorry, well, I mean, if, if, if it's a much larger amount then we have an, we have an insurance policy, yes. right? The, the issue with this is that it was a very small amount yes. such as below the deductible and not yes. worth engaging the insurance correct. company. The, but if it's a large amount then- Correct, the TV um, was priced at $198 when we, um, looked uh last week and our insurance deductible starts at 500 so it wasn't feasible to turn it into insurance well, i don't have an objection to paying for it we all want it broke somebody's gonna fix it so and state board of accounts was fine with using yes. this fund to be clear okay that was their suggestion that it come from general fund okay other questions in this direction? No? Okay. Uh, is there any public comment on the, the item at hand? I'm sorry. Um, sorry. I think we are ready for a vote then. Thank you. Councillor Deckard? Yes. Councillor Hawk? Yes. Councillor Crossley? Yes. Councillor Iverson? Yes. Councillor Wiltz? Yes. Councillor McKim? Yes. 
Councilor Munson. Yes. Motion passed unanimous. Thank you. And now we move on to a series of items from our own office. The first of which is a local income tax rate update from Molly Turner King, our legal staff. So I'm gonna sh I'm gonna share um, my screen, which is gonna be a PowerPoint with you guys. Okay. I'm sorry. Could you also speak a little bit more close to the microphone, please? Thanks. <laughs> we could all read it. <laughs> well, true. <laughs> A lot of soft-spoken people. Here, yeah, but president is one of them. Okay, so um, this presentation comes in light of the fact that on May fourth, um, the the city part of the local income council um, voted nine to one to impose an economic development income tax. So. This graph sorry, um, indicates what the current rate was and what the rate would be with the new economic development income tax. So we were at a 1.345% rate and it can show, you can see that that included a property tax relief, a public safety tax, the special purpose, which includes that juvenile tax and then a certified share. And then all of those percentages remain the same. It just on the top, you get added to this um, economic develop or edit tax, which is at a 0.69%. Uh, when does this go into effect? Based on when they passed it, which was before that deadline of September 1st, it would go into effect October 1st. Um, however, based on distribution um, schedules in the past, and speaking to Bree from the auditor's office, we think that we would see the start of the revenue in January of 2023. I'm trying to remove this. Okay. Um, so there are various ways that an, an edit could be distributed, but in the resolution passed by the city, they chose to use the population base. So that means that the revenue would be distributed amongst the four taxing units, which would be city, county, Ellettsville, and Steinsville. So this is um, the numbers that I got from the... Uh, last year's local tax um, income. And I used the numbers from this to help calculate what the anticipated 0.69% would be. So what I did was I used the public safety revenue because we know that that is, that 9 million right there is 25%. So using that, um, myself and Jeff Cockrell developed this graph which shows, sorry, that, so you have down here, the 9 million, which accounts for the 0.25% of the public safety tax. When you calculate out what 0.69% of that would be, you get 24,910,882.32. That would that number would be the number that is divided amongst the taxing units. So because it's population based, we used the percentages from the 2020 census, and that meant that Monroe County would receive 38.42 percent of that 24, which leaves us with an anticipated revenue of right here 9,569,930.92. As part um, of an edit tax, the taxing, the city, county, or 
taxing unit receiving the revenue would have to have a capital improvement plan. And I went ahead and included the statute that governs the capital improvement plan. It lists um, things that the plan must include. So a, a, it must identify and include a general description of each project that would be funded um, by the edit tax, the estimated total cost of the project, identifying all sources of funds expected to be used for each project and the planning development and construction schedule for each project. Um, the capital improvement plan uh, must encompass a period of not less than two years. And it must incorporate projects that cost, um, projects, well, sorry, must incorporate projects, the cost of which is at least 75% of the fractional amount of additional revenue. Um, so I, in speaking to Mr. Cockrell, we were talking about this today. We think this means that um, in your capital improvement plan, you have to have projects that would encompass 75% of the revenue that's coming in. So you could plan beyond that 75%, but it, in order to have a capital improvement plan that meets this statute, it would have to account for 75%. Um, I included a very long list of what edit could be used for. Um, I think what's important to note is we are going to be working with financial solutions group to help develop that cap, help us develop that capital improvement plan. Um, so this is just what we can use it for. And we're going to be in the process of developing with them what would be a good plan. Uh, last time we gave, I gave you an update on the fact that uh, city and county staffs have been working preparing a draft budget to present it to the dispatch board on that PS lit. And um, we had some concern that, well, we wanted to make sure that the passage of this new resolution imposing this edit didn't somehow impact that PS lit work that we have been doing. So there is the statute that says um, you can only increase, decrease uh, tax within once a year, which is that 3.6310. And so we posed a question to the DLGF. Um, as to whether if this edit, we had posed this question before the city voted. So the question was, if edit was passed, could we still adjust the PS lit? And their response was, um, ideally all lit changes would be discussed and adopted in a single action, but in the event that it's not, there could be some exceptions. So um, in the event a single action isn't possible, the department, meaning DLGF, has accepted multiple ordinances in the past from an income tax council as long as the second action didn't change a core lit rate or the rate being applied to taxpayers. So they basically said, yes, you could still adjust the allocation of the PS lit despite the fact that the edit was just passed. That was my update. If I'm happy to field questions. <laughs> yeah. No, not so much a question, but a comment that I think that it's it's good news that the DLGF will allow that uh, because mm -hmm. right. I, I believe it is hopefully everybody's into the intention of the Income Tax Council to adjust that PSAP rate down. And that's what we've been working on. Awesome. Thank you. And I'm, yeah, thanks for, for running that to ground with DLGF. Yes, um, a couple of things. Uh, when I was going over the uh, agreement, the interlocal agreement, uh, it states who's supposed to be preparing this budget. It's the sheriff and the, and the uh, Oh, and the but but there's also a board that's set up that's uh, and so I wondered who who is on that board, and I wondered if one of them might be Mike Cornland because it was like three wasn't there three and so if it's Mike Cornland would he still I'm just throwing out worries here 
since he has uh, declared that he is retiring, uh, will he still be allowed to serve on that board or does that need to be a new appointment? And should we be discussing this with Sheriff uh, rather than uh, the people in charge of the lit, which is the city? I mean, are we passing up some of those steps? <clears throat> Well, I don't know. So I'm just going by what that interlocal agreement says. I'm looking to see if Mr. Cockrell is still here, and he's not. But um, a number of people, including uh, uh, Ms. Turner King, have been discussing uh, the dispatch uh, proposals um, and what is going to be uh, adopted by their policy board. And I think. I mentioned at a previous meeting that there was a large surplus of funds uh, remaining from uh, appropriations in previous years, and they are going to, uh, there is a plan for uh, how those funds are to be spent. Uh, with agreement between the city and the county, they can be spent on operations and not solely on capital equipment. So, uh, this allows us then to uh, have a smaller request for funding for the public safety answering the PS part of, of the public safety list. And um, this is welcome news and I'm very happy that people are tackling this early so we're not uh, scooting around at the last minute trying to figure out what we're doing. But there's a, there's another meeting about this next week, so I'll update you on at the work session. And to her question, though, is there an is is, is there a board that involves? So there's the dispatch policy, policy board, board does accept the budget. And so yes. staff have been working on um, a solution to or a proposal on how to spend it down, but ultimately it would be the dispatch policy board who would accept it. I'm not spend sure who is on the dispatch policy board though, and I can okay. check. It's uh, according to the website, uh, Russell Brummett, Ryan Pedigo, Shannon Bunger, Dustin Dillard, and Jamie Washell. All right. Um, and they're spending down the extra balance, the balance they've been building up um, because they haven't been using all of their allocation. Correct. Got it. And then, it, so instead, there's no option for them to revert it into the distribution of PS lit for the coming year. I would have to check if there's a reversion option. Um, we've only talked about how to spend it down. And so um, I can check on that. I would be interested. Okay. Yes. I'm 100% sure it can't be reverted to the, the, well, there you the go. other units. It's sure that, that it can't be reverted to the, the, the four units uh, that were seeing no. PS lit. Otherwise, it is statutorily earmarked it, it for, is, exactly. for this. For dispatch, so we have to um, stat change. Okay. But I mean, this, I I just want to say this is this is something that the city and the county have been working together on for yeah. months and have been doing a great job. I, I know mm -hmm. uh, Cheryl, Councilor Munson, has been involved in that uh, pretty strongly. But the city and, and the county have been working together to come up with a plan to do this. I I I think it's a good example of how the city and county can, really can work together uh, and do work together mm -hmm. behind the scenes quite well. But that's. Um, yeah, that, that that this is a a plan that has been long in the making and understanding and discussing. Okay, here's what I thought I was, and maybe I'm just understanding it wrong. But since we all knew and we've known for some time that there was more money setting in there, not in, in what was not being spent each budget year. One of which was that. We were continuing to budget for all of the uh, dispatch operators, even though we were told by 
by those in control of that, that they couldn't put all those people on board in one year because they couldn't train them all in one year. So that just meant they were building up that cash balance. We, we knew that had to be the case. Um, but my thought all along was, oh, they could reduce the amount going to PSAP, the, the rate going to PSAP, and what, that's what we could do going into next year. Uh, and then that would free up that money next year that would then be able to be used for operating. And the, there would be the money for the city's law enforcement. I'm telling you, they could have done that if they wanted to. But we are where we are now. But I do think that part of that interlocal agreement didn't say, I mean, what it said was that the auditor would send to the city uh, the amount sufficient to cover the budget. It didn't say, uh, you know, when we're looking at the amount sufficient to cover any budget, we look at how much cash is there. We do a regular financial statement. You know, a 4B. Yep. So I, we've been trying to get that information how many years? Do you, I mean, and do you recall? Oh, yeah. But I, I'm saying that I didn't believe that's what the, yeah. this group uh, has, has been working on clarifying. It's not a 4B, but it is well, clarifying the cash it, position on, on both it sides. Will be a, a, yeah, they don't really do a 4B for yeah. these, but I think that certainly we could do it. Make sure, but, um, but I do think that the city council intends to work toward this because I heard uh, council member uh, Sandberg uh, allude to it. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and also with this uh, large uh, additional uh, supplemental that we'll be receiving. Uh, shortly, the information from DLGF, which is like $4,800,000. Uh, it's more than $800,000 uh, that we will be receiving uh, sometime soon. And so the distribution of that, part of that will go into that public safety. So that ought to also be additional money that they'll have. That's not reoccurring money always, but that'll be additional money there as well. Should be a fun summer. There's a lot to figure out. And, you know, sounds like to me. I need what you're saying. Are both of our representatives on the PS Lit committee involved in this? I'm not on the PS Lit committee. No, oh, but you're involved. But I'm I'm the dispatch liaison. Got it. And who is on the PS Lit committee this year? You are. Yeah. I think Trent right. is right. Am I the second? I think Trent's. I need right. to check the names. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, if things haven't picked here yeah. up. So right, we haven't started. Mean, it, it, should be, it should be smooth this year. Yeah, it's just smooth. <laughs> just asking. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Obviously, it's an interesting well, topic. You, and who prepares the uh, capital plan will i mean do do we have a, a vote on it or is it just the county commissioners it's, it's the executive it's, it's the exec county commissioners so yes. even if we wish that they would put it all into preparing for the jail uh, expenditures uh, so that we aren't spending it on other things that We'll have to wait and see what they think is important. And then they can go to the public when we have to put in additional tax because we didn't save the money. Well, we still have to appropriate it. So well, we have I to agree. Know, hey, we have to work hand in hand with yeah. the commission. Thanks. Office. That's what I'm saying. Yes. It's, quick. We have, but but it is, yeah, it's legally yeah. their responsibility to do it. And yeah. we can talk with them. It's like ARPA. We both have to, both, both sides have to agree. Yeah. Michelle, did you have something? Yes, I wanted to let you know that the PS Lit Committee members okay. is Councillor Hawk and Councillor McKim. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, I see, I know my committees. <laughs> so why do you think people are all like you with their hands in it so much? Yep. Do you think I was calling the state today saying I want an update? What do you think? I was just Sounds being like nosy? we appointed the right person. We did. So. <laughs> yep. 
Did you not know? What? He knew. No, he I knew was. I was. I thought Trent. Uh, I thought Councilor Decker thought he was. He to talk he was. To me before and I Trent just never forgets. On my own. A liaison. <laughs> I'm used to that. But I mean, we haven't even had a meeting yet. Yep. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Are there any further questions for Ms. King? Okay. Let's go ahead and move to item C. Uh, the cost of living adjustments discussion. Yes. So that Michelle can start her pre budgeting work. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to share my screen and if I can find it. I, uh, I'll just, maybe I can get on this. I was going to say I want to enlarge it, but I can't. There, maybe there. There we go. So this is just a reminder uh, to the public as well as the council that in in the past years that we have um, used the uh, Midwest Region CPI to determine what the COLA increase will be. And the COLA stands for the cost of living adjustment. Um, so for 2022, um, we had a flat rate or 2020, we did a flat rate of 35 cents on the hour. For 2021, uh, we did a um, 57 cent um, rate on the hour increase. And then for 2022 is when uh, we did the WIS recommendations. And so um, for this year, uh, the percentage is 7.5 and you need to decide if you're going to do a flat or a percentage. So with that, I went through to create um, a, a little help chart for you guys. Um, so I need from you a proposed increase so that I can begin and start the, um, the grids for 2023. And so if you look and you chose to go with a 7.5% or a flat rate, the flat rate is a $1.99 increase on the hour. So yeah, I, you know, wishful thinking, but you know, <laughs> but so um, the state, I wanted to give you what the state's um, there, they have selected 3.33%. That equates to an 88 cent, um, 88 cents on the hour increase. So then I just went through and I did 1%, 1.5, 2%, 2.5, and you can see that. So that kind of gives you an idea of where the flat rate would be if you chose to go with a flat rate on the hour. So, and I can come up with, you know, more percentages or whatever. I just, this is just kind of an idea uh, for you guys to kind of just give me some direction on how to move forward, just so that we can have a proposal or proposed grid. So I can get the department started on the form 144, which is the recommended uh, state budget um, pre-form with regards to salaries that has to be completed by each department, so. And you don't even have to have anything. We can keep things flat. So, you know, I just, I just need some guidance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I see questions okay, starting with Councilor Hawk. Uh, actually, I think that the form and that she's speaking of is then required to be turned over to the commissioners. Mm -hmm. And the commissioners then are required to present to us their suggested increase. However, we usually have a letter that goes out that says what we think it should be. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that up. Right. I, I just wanted to know, and have you done any calculations of the fiscal impacts of any of those amounts No, yet? I haven't. Because I, I, I just didn't know where to start. So. I, I think that's... Um, you know, I think you could just do say, 
what a 1% would cost. And then we can just multiply it by seven and a half or three or whatever numbers we want. And then maybe a dollar an hour as a flat rate, just do those two calculations okay. and we can then adjust, we at least get some idea. Of so a 1% of and go. then a dollar. Okay. I mean, do, do others agree? They're just simple numbers that we can then multiply as, I think, as needed. I do think that would be helpful. Yeah. I had a follow-up question on that, and that's for Michelle. I know when we looked at the WIS, when we implemented the WIS study, there were some issues with doing base percentages because it, things weren't calculating easily for you. Is Councilor McKim's request fairly yes. doable? Okay. All yes. Right. The, uh, the, the issue was that we were doing so many all at once and you hadn't really settled on anything. So when we, you finally did, I pulled the wrong ones. Okay. So since we are starting so early, I will be able, and we were such on a crunch time-wise yeah. at the end of last year, it, it just caused a little bit of chaos. We're starting early enough now that this will, there won't be an issue, so. So, in the interest of keeping our budget on schedule, and I know you just said we were, we had time, um, would it be prudent to recommend flat budgeting for the departments? And then we can go back in and how much extra work is that on your end to add the COLA later? We, we are now moving toward uh, remote budgeting. Yeah. So with that, it's going to cut down on the back and forth with uh, the departments. So once we decide, or we being council, it has made a decision on what to do, it will be up to the departments to make that entry into the, um, into the LAO budget portals. Mm -hmm. And then we being um, my new person that we have and myself, we will proof those and make sure that those are correct so that way it's a, it'll be a double check and then we'll have one more check with the internal auditor because uh that will be the third and final check to make sure that we have everybody right so um as long as we can get a, a decision on what you want to do before um the uh, first of august that will give us plenty of time to make any changes necessary. Okay. okay. Do you have questions? No question. Do you have any other questions? So if you could provide the impact information to us and um, we can look at it at the next meeting. Work session? Yeah, at the work session, that would be great. This is really helpful, thank you. And we can move to the next item then, which is an update on the elected official office compensation questionnaire. Um, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. If I can find it, there it is. Uh, with the help of um, Auditor Smith and Molly Turner King, who is awesome. Uh, we created this um, questionnaire and this went out to all 92 counties. So this it just kind of gives you uh, the questions. Uh, a copy of it is included in the packet. So, um, but just for this first page, we went through and we asked uh, these basic questions. We have, this was mailed out the middle of April. We have received back 42 questionnaires. Mm, wow. Pretty good. That's, That's good. good. Yeah. Uh, not all of them have all of the blanks completed, yeah, but yeah. we've got a majority of the information. So I've had my new gal, Lindsay, she's, we've started on an Excel spreadsheet and we're inputting that information. Um, Auditor Smith has asked for the department or the counties that haven't turned them in, and she is going to send out a like a little email nudge saying, hey, can you send it to us? So, 
So we're hoping maybe we'll get a little bit more information from counties, but we got half turned in and I think that's fantastic. So I think this will help you once we get it all together. Um, and I hope to have it maybe by May, you know, depending on how fast she it's May. gets that in. It's May now. Oh, I mean, June, sorry. <laughs> June, you know, yeah, kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, but, that's really so. great. Um, was this in our packets? Yes, thank you. It is in the packet. I, and we, uh, we limited it to the assessor, the auditor, clerk, commissioners, coroner, council, recorder, surveyor, and treasurer. We did not include um, the sheriff because his is a different statutory or contract mm -hmm. amount that you guys have agreed to. And he mimics the uh, prosecutor. Prosecutor is an elected official. She's, they are not included on this. So um, this is the one. So we just included the uh, elected officials that you guys set the salaries for. Yep. And there was a, a question from one of the counties about the rep, total revenues. I total believe. revenue. Could you tell me, or if you remember, remind me what the clarification was that went out. Right. Um, at the very top here, it says 2021, it says property tax um, and income tax. And so uh, a county asked, well, are you asking for general fund only? Or are you asking for all funds or what was there a breakdown? So counselor or auditor Smith um, asked and had an email sent out from the auditor of state with a clarifying um, email that is for all fund totals mm -hmm. with regards to property tax and income taxes. So great. So, and like I said, not everybody has completed the, the top section. So um, we do have some that did not complete that at all. So, is but that, that's just, a, a, you know, the first few that we've opened, so. Is that hard to find that information though? That, I mean, I, is that something that I don't know. might be? I'm sure it's somewhere. Yeah, I would think you could. Yeah, I, I would, yeah. I would and that's what I thought it, once maybe we- Lindsay could. Look we for can, that. Okay. Yeah, we can go into Gateway and pull whatever okay. we need. Yeah. Okay. This is great. Thank you very much. I'm excited to have someone on board who can start um, helping enter the information and organize it. Are there any questions from anyone else? It's sort of I just, I was just going to say, I'm impressed with that response rate. <laughs> you blew me away. I thought for sure it would not be like I thought, that. I know. I thought it'd be about 10%. Mm -hmm. yeah. No. Well, the incentive isn't quite like a thousand dollars, but yeah. well, <laughs> uh, the letter that we included with them said that we would share this information. Yep. Uh, so, and we're going to share it with all of counties, even if they didn't participate. So, that's awesome. <laughs> but yeah. yeah, yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Um, do, do, do we are on to item fourteen? Council, I move to approve the recommendation to appoint Anthony Satilli to the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, completing a term that expires on December 31st, 2022. And um, this is a position that's been vacant for quite some time. And I was delighted to have Mr. Satilli uh, submit an application. Um, he has, I've worked with him on the CBC, the Con Convention and Visitors Commission. That's what it is. And he um, has always been knowledgeable and um, engaged. And I think he will make a wonderful addition to the uh, Alcohol Beverage Commission. Are there questions or concerns regarding the appointment? Okay, all right. Um, there is there any public comment? Okay, seeing no others, then we will have a roll call vote on appointing Mr. Satilli. Councillor Deckard. Yes. Councillor Iverson. Yes. Councillor Crossley. Yes. Councillor Munson. Yes. Councillor McKim. Yes. Councillor Wilts. Yes. Councillor Hawk. Yes. Motion passed unanimous.
I just want to remind um, anyone out there in the entire county, we do have three vacancies on our Women's Commission and have for quite some time. And it's an am amazing group of amazing women. And if you, you don't have to be a woman to be on the commission. As long as you support the activities that support women, we encourage you to apply. Um, it's a really great group. We are not a scary group. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really is scary. on board. And so we, um, we're trying really hard. Um, and I think our big challenge is we just have a lot of people that are tapped out and burnt out with lots of things. But if you are not tapped out or burnt out, please consider applying today. We should have a dance. Or something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, item 15, please. All right, Council, I move to approve the April 12, 2022 regular session and April 26, 2022 work session minutes. Second. Um, are there any council members who would like to modify or edit the minutes? I, I would yes. just like to say anyone that reads the April 26, 2022 work session minutes will see the many mistakes I made while acting in your place, Madam <laughs> President. We missed you very much. I really appreciate you standing in, in um, while I was away. So can we have a roll call vote to approve the minutes, please? Councilor Munson? Yes. Councilor Deckard? Yes. Councilor Iverson? Yes. Councilor Crossley? Yes. Councilor Hawk? Yes. Councilor Wiltz? Yes. Councilor McKim? Yes. Motion passed unanimous. And do we have any council comments for the evening? No? Yes. Um, I know it's been said a couple of different times this evening, but um, as one of the liaisons to the county clerk's office, again, just want to give her um, Clerk Brown and her staff a tremendous round of applause for doing the work. And although we know that, you know, we had a low voter, voter turnout, it seems to be that everybody that I encountered with had a very positive experience and myself going on a Saturday and voting had a very positive experience as well. So I just wanted to extend gratitude to their office as well. Um, my other thing that I wanted to add is the fact that I know we're in the process of talking about lit and how that just went through last week, but I do want to inform the public, myself along with um, some other um, um, community members um, and organizations have been working with MCCSC, our school corporation, because the referendum is coming. Um, and we know that it has been very difficult uh, as, again, as a mom of three that has been dealing with transportation issues um, in our school corporation. We know that funding is very low and um, public schools has, have definitely suffered quite a bit, especially with the hit of COVID. And so, Although with LIT, we know that, you know, we just had that come about and we are asking people again for, um, with the referendum again to consider this. Again, this is something that will be considered in the general election, but conversations will be, and they are starting to come about. And so I just want to ask as um, a person that was helping out with that, if anybody has any questions in regards to that, please reach out to me and let me know. But of course, it is very vital that we are taking care of our public education because uh, we know that that has been defunded for quite a bit. Um, so again, that's just something that has been brought up and it is very near and dear to my heart. And as we saw earlier with our PK, um, pre-K items, uh, that's, also, those are things that could be funded with lots of different things. So I just wanted to put a public plea and request out there as well. Thank you. Important, important news. Anyone else have any comments? Okay, I don't think I do either. So I will now adjourn our meeting. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.